Uh, let me talk to you also about uh, what we are seeing as far as the digital landscape is concerned. And I know that this is a space that you've been uh, actively uh, looking at and very confident of its growth. Uh, whether we talk about UPI transactions, so on and so forth, we've seen the steady up move. Today, of course, reports about uh, uh, Paytm being in talks with another conglomerate for a potential deal. We understand that those talks uh, uh, haven't moved any further beyond the preliminary discussions. But how do you see the landscape shaping up? Do you believe that we are likely to see significant consolidation uh, in the fintech space? Yeah, Shirin, something interesting is happening in the fintech space. This is uh, the 60, 70,000, uh, maybe now 80,000 uh, that were set up. I've gotten to see a few of them primarily in the financial services sector. And it's an amazing story. The platform value that they've created and what the platform can do is unbelievable. And the problem is that uh, their uh, investors uh, find that all you need to look at is uh, getting to be a unicorn and uh, you know pile up losses in the, in the interim, which I think uh, is an inappropriate story, uh, part. Uh, and that has led to this uh, story that we are talking about. Uh, of, uh, you know, will, is it stable, will it uh, lead to uh, uh, mergers, acquisitions, at all? So I think there's a disconnect between uh, value creation in the platform and valuation expectations. I think this is what entrepreneurs would need to first address and then uh, investors would first need to address. Thereafter, progress will uh, happen because progress certainly will happen and uh, these people are contributing a significant part to that progress of uh, our economy. Now, coming to... Uh, Again, uh, what is happening at the deep end, as it were, of uh, the technology platform. What I've seen over the five years, uh, 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 in the last uh, five months, is the cost of technology has dropped to an extent which is unbelievable. You know, I am a, a strong believer in Moore's Law, and that is how we did the rollout in uh, my old bank, I say, say bank, going back 20, 25 years. But today's costs are, are just unbelievable. You know, uh, when I started looking, taking a deep dive, as it were, I had expectations, let's say, technology costs would be X, but now I believe that technology costs really are not even 0.2X, maybe 0.1X, or what I mind just five or six months back. So with this, this sort of uh, change in technology costs, uh, you know, this is going to do the same thing that low data, low cost of data has done to the wider public. That is, uh, the, the Digitex and the new builds, as it were, the new companies, will be able to come into being at very low cost. And uh, they could provide great service to the country. And there will indeed be some disruption as a process. So uh, we will see some exciting things going on. And uh, the good thing here is that we are at just the start of this curve. And uh, the whole digital process and the impact of digitalization in India uh, and its impact on the GDP will be probably the next exercise that uh, economics should really work, work on. I was just looking at uh, numbers uh, from uh, China the other day. Uh, from well, five years back, almost nothing. Today, last year when I saw it, it was contribution to GDP was 35 percent. This year, the number is 40 percent. So my belief is that uh, you know, five years from now, if you look at India, how much incremental contribution will be there from the digital economy is going to be, a, to me, a very exciting number. And that number, I would think, will not be less than 20 percent. I think it's in the 20, 25 percent of the economy. So we are all undercounting our growth. So we have our growth that's put out now, but nobody has a fix on what will digital India contribute. It's going to be a significant part, not only in terms of growth, but also in terms of employment generation. We have, we don't have a fix on the employment generation that's happening. Now, we might need that. We might need to really recategorize the workers because, for example, if you look at uh, the delivery uh, system that's happening, uh, going from e-commerce, uh, we call them gig workers. I think we should not call them gig workers. We should title them properly. We should make sure, sure they're under a structure which is properly uh, implemented. And why should we keep, and we should bring them very to the center of the, what I call the organized labor market. I do not know where exactly they're falling today. We should bring them to the center of the organized uh, you know, labor market so that we also have a proper idea of what really is employment and what is unemployment. So I think there are exciting things we could do. But bottom line, Digital India will contribute a significant part to our group going forward. Uh, so let me just uh, uh, try and uh, get you to labor on that point a little bit more specifically, sir, in the context of geo-financial services. You do believe that this is an exciting time as far as the digital India story is concerned, but specifically uh, for the geo-financial services aspiration. Uh, you know, what next and what can we expect? 
You know, again, uh, at this stage, uh, we are working out uh, the whole uh, rolling out in a way, uh, the plan, not a, not yet into execution mode. Uh, so all I can say is whatever was said in the demerger document uh, stays. We will uh, we are working on that to get the demerger out. And it will be premature for me to say it till uh, the plan is approved and we roll out. But you know, the background that I indicated to you, the cost disruption that I indicated to you, the leanness in which you can build, I think all going to segue into uh, uh, any companies build out into uh, including uh, uh, geo financial services. So. We are, we are looking at a very exciting time uh, of entry where I believe there's another dis disruption that's happening in the technology context, the disruption happening in the aspirations of our people and the growth momentum. So all should uh, you know uh, board well for you or any new aspirant who's coming in at this point of time with virtually clean slate. Uh, Mr. Kamath, I want to go back now to the real infrastructure story. We just talked about digital infrastructure and the digital play, but let's go back to the infrastructure story in the context of NABFID. Uh, you know, the MD of IAFCL, uh, uh, while speaking to us here on CNBC TV 18, said he believes that India requires a specific law for infrastructure. Now, A, do you believe that that is necessary? B, uh, how is NABFID's role going to be different, for instance, from IAFCL's? I, uh, I cannot comment on what uh, you would have said because I do not know the context in which I said it, so, and I have not uh, looked at it. I think NAPFIT's role is very clear in its charter, and uh, I think it's a very, very expansive role. And its role is, uh, you know, uh, I would think not only just a DFS, DFI, but also a catalyst. It could catalyze other uh, institutions and uh, so on. Uh, so I think uh, the role, uh, there are, I think, points where uh, the roles would uh, overlap in a way, and that's good because we need uh, more long-term players. But um, the charter, to me, appears to be much wider than what is uh, there in any other institution, and that's the reason why this institution was uh, created. So, uh, uh, and, I, 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 and, and I believe it is needed. I believe it is needed, uh, given our earlier discussion in terms of uh, what we see as uh, the, the growth momentum over the next 25 years, the role of infrastructure, and uh, the role of uh, government in that infrastructure. So all these uh, require institutions with long-term capability. Shirin, in this context, what I want to basically touch on is, you know, we have had banks doing the role of uh, a true infrastructure uh, debt provider uh, as an interim measure. After, you know, 2000 or 1995-96, when the existing DFI, in a way, did not have access to funds and went out of uh, you know, that role, today, we have a situation where there, those funds are available. Those funds are available in the system through the insurance setup, through the pension setup, and even through the mutual fund setup for savers, savers are going in for various instruments and so on, and directly from the capital market. So there are multiple sources available today, and funding is getting uh, done through a variety of means, as you see, long-term funding. So honestly speaking, uh, the banks can do long-term lending only for a short time, not as a consistent. Uh, you know, strategy going forward because increasingly their uh, funding is a shorter and shorter term. And uh, again, as more technology comes in into the, the marketplace, as it were, you know, long-term instruments can be made to look like, um, you know, almost monthly servicing instruments. I just heard that NHI has in mind to issue monthly interest to its uh, bondholders. Can you imagine the change it will make? Uh, here's the government institution, AAA, which the government, which the public looks at as government, offering you monthly interest rates, which are significantly higher than either uh, any rate that a bank can offer. So I think there's going to be a whole lot of disruption in terms of the way banks will need to handle uh, you know, their own uh, growth and their deployment of assets. And if you have an, on an average one year money or less in terms of tenor, lending it out longer, is uh, you're going, you're putting your neck on a, on a line with the, you do not know the consequences. So I think uh, bankers will be more cautious in lending long out. And that is why I think the government's move in setting up NAPFI was very timely. And we need to create a, it's an ecosystem to finance infrastructure. And I think that's going to happen. We will see it in the next two years. Well, uh, that certainly is the hope. Mr. Kamath, let me end by asking you, you, uh, you talked about the growth momentum. Uh, so at this point in time, uh, you know, your take on where things currently stand, how confident do you feel about us being able to hold the kind of momentum we are seeing? And if I were to ask you about the single biggest risk that we face today uh, from an economic point of view, what would that be? Yeah, the single biggest risk I'll address first, simply 
And all along, it's been uh, unpredictable oil price. But I think we now have an indication what is happening to oil price for a very simple reason. We are not seeing uh, the world uh, you know, grow at a pace that uh, they expect. It is very clear. And I've been tracking uh, numbers from uh, China where uh, the growth numbers look really, really, really uh, low You know, from what uh, feedback I have, uh, which I continue to have in terms of what's happening there. Europe, we all know what, it, what is happening. And uh, the US, I think, is just treading water as it were. So given that uh, you know, the demand for oil, demand for various products is going to be low outside in the outside world. So we are lucky. So the oil price should then uh, be stable. And we have our own market to uh, cater to, which is growing well. So yes, it may be a, a bit of an insulated story, but uh, I think uh, we will uh, weather this well. In the meantime, you know, we drive our own strength through uh, not only the digital movement, but through exports of what I call knowledge services, which is not going to slow down. So the world will need that. So we are in a sweet spot. See, growth stalls, when does growth stall? Growth stalls when there is no demand for what has to be produced. And in India's case, the headline, what has to be produced is put that infrastructure in place, whether it is roads, ports, airports, rail systems, or whatever, airlines, whatever. That needs to go in. And, uh, you know, to look at where we are and where we have to go, we get, we get a long, long runway. So I don't see demand as a customer. So if you have a domestic demand, that creates employment, that creates aspirations. I don't think our growth story is going to get derailed on that account. What we need to make sure is that we nurture it properly. And as we discussed in the earlier segment, the key part of nurturing is steady policy, incrementally better policy, which is, which is being done, and interest rates which are stable. The, the, the disturbance could have been caused, the shock could have been caused by external uh, oil and such factors, not by demand, because we are we are in a way insulated. So I think we are in a good place with the digital providing as a nice wedge as we go along, and uh, all of us need to uh, encourage that growth. Mr. Kamat, always a pleasure. Appreciate you joining us here on CNBC TV 18 on the record to take us through what you make of uh, some of the important developments that have taken place and taking shape over the last few months, and more importantly, what the road ahead looks like. Uh, appreciate your time, and thanks very much for joining us. That is K.V. Kamat, chairman of uh, the NABFID, uh, with his take on the state of the economy. We are going to take a break, but return with the market action. Don't go anywhere. We're back in a minute with more.